Uh, well, thanks everybody for being here. I hope your reinvent's off to a great start. I recognize for some of you, I might be your last stop before a happy hour or team dinner, so I'll try to make the next 15, 20 minutes uh, somewhat worth your time. Uh, my name is Tatum Tummins. I'm a senior product manager at Kion, and today is all about the future of the FinOps industry, and as the title would suggest, we think it looks a lot like CloudOps. And so, to give you a little bit of background on me, uh, I've been at Kion for a little over a year now, but prior coming over to the vendor side, um, I was a practitioner at a large healthcare company for about seven and a half years, and for those of you that are followed a similar trajectory, that's before FinOps was ever a term that people talked about and before it ever existed. So um, I was fortunate enough to see it evolve and seeing how it's changed over the years to where it's now much more popular and people know what I'm talking about for the most part when I say FinOps. Um, but it's that perspective plus the perspective of the customers that I've got to meet over the last year that lead me to kind of the, the point of today, which is why we think that cloud ops is going to be an integral part of the future of FinOps. And so with that, we'll level set with an agenda. It's super simple. I'm going to start and define what I mean when I say cloud ops and FinOps. I'm sure most of you probably have a good understanding, but we'll just baseline with a simple definition of each. Uh, and then we're going to talk about why I believe they're better when they collaborate and work together. And then lastly, I'm going to put some specifics around what I think that collaboration should or will look like. And it's something at Kion we call governance by default. And so with that, let's move into cloud ops. So I'll preface and say that cloud ops looks a little different at every organization. So this is super macro. For some of your organizations, it looks a lot like DevOps, or it looks a lot like cloud engineering or cloud architecture. But for today's purposes, I'm going to summarize it with these four going left to right. The first is cost management. So with the rise of FinOps, ma managing costs is a little bit of everybody's responsibility, and CloudOps is no different. It looks like identity management. So this is the actual assigning the privileges and access to accounts as they're being provisioned. Then it's infrastructure management. So this is the ongoing managing of those accounts, standing up shared infrastructure, the monitoring, and also making sure those accounts are uh, in line with your company's uh, compliance policies. And then lastly, and this is a critical one that I'm going to reference a lot today, but it's developing automation. So that's automating processes, automating ways to get developers and engineers deployed to the cloud quicker, automating the account provisioning process, trying to make all of that a little bit more streamlined. And so to summarize it, I'll call cloud ops saying that it's focused on the delivery, optimization, and performance of infrastructure. Now moving on to FinOps. So I've got the definition on the screen, but I'll summarize the definition and just say, FinOps is about maximizing the business value of your cloud through collaboration. And you achieve that by three high-level phases that are up on the screen. And so working your way through it, starting with the inform phase, it's all about how do I get visibility into my spend, and then ultimately how do I allocate that spend to the right users, the right cost centers, budgets, whatever it may be. But it's about that inform and ultimately the alloc allocation. Then you move to the optimized phase, and that's about how do I reduce my efficient, or how do I increase my efficiency, reduce usage, reduce my spend. So that's deleting waste, that's buying a reserved instance or a savings plan, or it's just maximizing the efficiency of your workloads. And then lastly, you move into the operate phase, which is all about continuous improvement. And this is where we're going to spend a lot of our conversation today. But in the operate phase, you're looking to build out those policies, processes, and long-term, sustainable, repeatable processes to mature your FinOps practice over time. And so with our common definition set, let's move in to a story. So this is back in my practitioner days, and I'm going to walk through something that I'm sure a lot of you relate to, even if the details are a little different. Um, but several years ago, when the AI discussion was really taking off and blockchain was a, was a new hot topic, uh, one of our GMs decided that we wanted to explore how that could impact one of our applications. So product kicks off this idea of we want to test this theory. And like a normal workflow, the cloud ops team gets a request to provision a sandbox account for, for the engineers to work on. They kind of rush it out the door to try to give access to the whole team because this was a high priority initiative. Development starts from the engineering perspective. And then little old me at the time comes into work on a Monday morning, and I see this $50,000 spike. And in this particular case, not only was the spend alarming, I actually didn't know who owned it. There was no tagging on it. And because the account was brand new from the past week, I actually didn't even know the account existed. Right. So a lot of things went wrong in this process. And so where I'll pause and say is, this entire workflow there's FinOps activity happening at every stage, right? There's a process to improve, there's more value to be had. But when we did our own root cause analysis of 
how do we fix this from happening again? What we realized is that the biggest opportunity for improvement was actually at this stage, was at the cloud ops stage of the process. And so to walk you through what that should have looked like or what that could look like, we'll reset the stage, same concept, the business kicks off this idea, it goes to the cloud ops team for provisioning, but this time, a couple things happen. We look at these accounts and we say, well, how do we start with least privilege access first? So how do we make sure only the developers who need access have access, and that access isn't over-provisioned? And then it looks like tagging automation. So we know what team was supposed to be working on this. Why don't we actually enforce the, the key value pairs that we expect to be on these instances automatically before it ever goes into development? And then lastly, it looks like having a financial policy. So that could be something as, it's a sandbox account, I don't want it to spend more than X per day. Or it could say, I want to restrict it to only these certain instance types because anything outside of that is really out of scope of what the project's looking for. And now, with those three things added, development starts, and I don't come in to Monday morning and see that spike that occurred. And so this hypothetical, I hope, illustrates part of the message that we're going to share today about why we think cloud ops needs to have a heavier role in your FinOps processes. So before I get to the specifics, I'm going to try to summarize that hypothetical with three large themes. The first is, by adding cloud ops and FinOps together, you allow each team to rely on their strengths. We talked about at the beginning how cloud ops is uniquely centered to govern and automate processes. And when we think about the operate phase of FinOps, governance policies, Compliance monitoring and automation are all things that are a part of that, and we think cloud ops teams are better suited to drive those activities. Then, you have to think about FinOps as more than just optimizing your spend. It's about optimizing processes and making your processes more valuable. And so, by having and investing in automation up front, you allow your teams to go off and do other activity that's ultimately more valuable. To give a quick example of this is, let's say you have a retention policy for AWS snapshots, and in your dev accounts, you say that's six months. If you automate that policy and make sure that those dev snapshots are cleaned up every six months, no human now has to take time out of their day to go verify and make sure that they can be deleted. You actually already have automation in place to take care of that for you. And lastly, it helps eliminate risk. So by investing in this proactive governance, you essentially help secure your processes, which not only has a security and identity and compliance benefit, but it also helps secure your cloud budgets. And we'll talk about how that's possible here in just a moment. So I mentioned at the beginning some vocabulary or language around what we think this should look like. And we call it governance by default. And so I'm going to lay out a high level view of what we think organizations will begin to look like over time as they adopt this kind of mindset. And so the first is simply visibility. We think that just having view into your spend in one tool and then using another tool for your policies or another tool for your identity is going to be a way of the past. Those things are inherently all ways that you manage your infrastructure and should be in the same tool and managed together. And so it starts by being able to see and view them all together. And then it looks like guardrails. So it's proactively defining, well, this is what my accounts should and shouldn't be able to do. And these are what my co company policies are. And it's putting those in place and then using automation to actually enforce those guardrails. So I, I mentioned the simple example of like a snapshot retention policy. It's putting that automation and those guardrails on those accounts on the front end so that once it goes into development, you already have your critical policies automated and running on your accounts. From there, it looks like access control. We really firmly believe in least privilege access and starting with what is the minimum access and the minimum developers that need access to this account. You can automate those things and determine what those roles and access look like for your company and have that be a part of your account provisioning process. And then lastly, it ties all together with more traditional FinOps and, and cost control. So just like I talk about putting your guardrails for your company's compliance policies, you can also put financial guardrails or financial policies in place that say, well, this is my budget, and I either I want to be notified, let's say. Or some organizations could say, no, I actually want to uh, enforce weekend shutdowns and terminations for my sandbox and dev accounts. It can look like a lot of different ways, but ultimately, it's setting up these guardrails, automating them to give yourself control over identity, access, and cost 
which is ultimately how we would summarize governance by default. It's the interconnectedness of identity compliance and cost, and they're being proactively managed together. And what I'd call out here before I move on is at some point you have to invest time into your FinOps processes. And today, a lot of that is reactively. You're already spending money, you've already made a mistake, or you realize you need to do some cleanup, and you're investing time to undo or make things cheaper. We think there's an opportunity to just take that same time investment and do it proactively on the front end to prevent that waste from ever existing to begin with. And that's ultimately what governance by default is trying to drive. And so I'm gonna take back, just for consistency's sake, that same example of that sandbox account I talked about at the beginning. And I'm just gonna show a couple steps of what governance by default might look like. So first step, a request is made for that AI sandbox account. In this scenario, that account is automatically provisioned with least privilege access, and it's restricted to only a handful of developers. Automation is in place at the time of creation so that any resources that are spun up are going to be in line with whatever the company's tagging and compliance policies are. And then a financial policy is put in place, and this is just a hypothetical, but to prevent more than $300 a day, a day in spend, it's automatically restricted to US regions only, and only certain AI-based services are permitted to be deployed. And so now, within just a few hours, you've got this provisioned account, you've got visibility into ownership and access, you have appropriate controls, and you have the ability to see identity, compliance, and cost within one view. We firmly believe that as companies adopt this, they're gonna be faster, they're gonna be leaner, and they're ultimately also gonna be more secure. And so, I won't spend a ton of time here, but as a person in a company that believes in this, I do want to quickly just highlight a couple of the features that we help uh, provide our customers to enable this. Uh, my hope is that for those of you that are interested, you'll come meet us over at booth 1957, I think is the booth, uh, to learn more, ask questions. But today's just a couple of exam examples. So the first is a feature called Action Plans. So think of this as metadata, so a tag, a label that you put on in Kion that actually automates policy throughout your organization. So what that might look like is at your top level organization, you might say every account needs to restrict a public IP address on an S3 bucket, something super simple. But as you get deeper in the organization, you might have applications that have unique policies that need to adhere, adhere to. In Kion, you can simply put a piece of metadata to completely drive all of the policies that go to that specific account that might differ from the rest of your organization. Another example of this are those financial enforcements I've been talking about. So every organization's at a different maturity level and a different process. So for some organizations, a financial enforcement might just be, hey, I want a Slack notif notification when X happens. For some organizations, it might be that you trust Kion and you trust your policies enough to actually allow Kion to take automated action on terminating an unattached EBS volume, let's say. Or you might actually just want to adjust and right size an instance based off a recommendation. Whatever it looks like for you guys, some sort of financial enforcement, Kion's here to provide you an opportunity and an option for that. And then it looks like custom variables. So there's a lot that we could go into with custom variables, but for the basis of today's conversation, when I talk about tagging automation, that's how Kion makes this possible. So the idea being that for wherever you are in the organization, whatever the account may be, you can actually dictate what key value pairs you expect and what you want to enforce on those accounts. So there is no idea of some rogue, unidentified instance within your organization. And the key part is that all of these cloud ops features are combined with your traditional FinOps features. So now you've got a tool that's essentially allowing you to have end-to-end -end -end governance to be able to manage all of your infrastructure and all of your identity and all of your compliance in one place. And so before I break here, uh, I do want to give an example of one of our customers that we've helped achieve this. And I actually think we uh, met them at reInvent a few years ago, and one of them's here uh, in attendance today. Um, but I wasn't here, so this part's more of a story, but uh, my understanding is that this customer came to us, and at the time, they had a couple hundred accounts and less than 10 million in annual spend. And I believe they came here just looking for cost control. They knew they were gonna be scaling, and they wanted a better way to manage budgets and manage their spend as they grew in the cloud. And through talking to vendors and looking for what was in the market, 
what they realized is the solution they needed was a little bit broader than that. They actually needed a little bit more of a governance tool because as they scaled their accounts, they needed a better way to manage the access in those accounts and what those accounts ultimately could do. And what they found with Kion is they solved their cost control needs first and foremost with budgets, financial transparency. They've now grown to over 200 million in annual spend. But they also found that they reduced their account provisioning time by 10 times that allowed them to actually scale and grow, grow at the pace they desired. And so now they've got over 3,000 accounts today. And the big piece is the bottom bullet, which is that they found a foundational tool that their organization relies on for end-to-end -end governance that allows them to continue and enable that scale at growth. And so we're proud to have been a part of that journey, and that's the journey we hope to take more customers on um, over the next couple of years. And so, Lastly, as I start to get closer and closer on my time, and I promise you guys to get to your happy hours sooner, uh, four small takeaways. So the first is simply, we think FinOps and CloudOps are better when paired together. Um, we talked a little bit about the why, we talked about the strengths, we talked about the automation piece, there's a lot of reasons why, but ultimately we think organizations need to rely on that relationship more heavily. By doing that, in order integrating your FinOps teams into that cloud ops governance strategy, you're going to set yourself up for long-term success. So we talked about the operate phase and some of what's supposed to happen in that kind of FinOps phase. We think by pairing your cloud ops team with FinOps, you essentially uh, are able to maximize the processes that you're building out in that phase for long-term success because you're investing in automation up front. By embracing that automation and proactive governance, you're going to achieve greater efficiency and cost savings. I could give a lot of examples of how this is true, but whether it's preventing a cost spike from ever existing, or it's deleting waste before it ever becomes waste, or it's actually preventing someone from having to manually go understand why uh, you know, an S3 bucket is uncompliant with one of their you know, compliance programs, whatever it may be, CloudOps provides a lot of value that's absolutely critical for long-term success. And lastly, we believe that organizations that adopt this governance by default approach will go faster with less risk and ultimately maximize the business value of their cloud, which is what FinOps is ultimately all about. And so with that, I thank you all for being here. Um, Kion is actually having a bunch of fun giveaways right after this in like 15 minutes. I think it's a MetaQuest headset uh, and an Aura ring. So come test, test your luck with a raffle over there. Um, I'll hang out here if any of you have questions for me. I'll be at the booth the rest of the, this week if you want to come by and talk shop, ask more details about how we make this possible. But appreciate you guys all being here, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your reInvent.